Good evening, church. It's so good to see you again as we continue our study on hermeneutics, as we continue to strengthen our ability to interpret the Bible the way that God intended when he inspired the writers through the work of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about what was the overarching meaning of the Bible or the overarching message of the Bible. Well, tonight, we're going to kind of continue in that same thought process as we look at the question, is the Bible really all about Jesus? Well, I know that many of you are probably just audibly just said out loud, uh, verbally just said rather, yes. Yes, the whole Bible uh, points to Jesus. Yes, everything we read uh, can point us back to Jesus. And if you said that, then, then you're correct. Because even though it may be obscure at times, and the passage may at first be a little ambiguous that it's not clear, uh, with a further study, we can always um, journey back to a place where that particular passage of Scripture may not directly say Jesus, but it is pointing to uh, something in regards to Christ or Maybe you say a Christ-centered verse or a Christocentric uh, theme or meaning. And so what we want to do is we want to spend our time tonight kind of unpacking that, that thought. Uh, is the Bible really all about Jesus? And so we know that uh, Jesus being the Son of God is um, he is the, the lead. Uh, and I don't want to say anything theologically incorrect and I don't want to be offensive, but uh, Jesus is the lead character in the Bible. Everything we read, or he's the the star uh, that in, in the Bible. And what I mean by that is that everything points to him. Everything is uh, surrounded by him. Everything is inspired by him. He is uh, the one in which we read and we learn about. And so... So let's begin in the easy part in the New Testament. Uh, in the in the New Testament, uh, basically is named that just because it's uh, it points and shows us the God's fulfillment from the prophecies that He has made in the Old Testament, which we will get to here in just a little bit. And so, um, as we continue to journey through Dr. Plummer's book, I'm going to reference him uh, several times this evening as we go through our study and I want to just use kind of his structure as we kind of unpack this this chapter he first uh, says compared to the Old Testament the New Testament's Christ-centered nature is readily apparent and I think many of us would agree with that the first the first area he points out is Jesus as the subject of revelation and now it's not necessarily talking about the the book of Revelation, but just Revelation, the things being revealed. Uh, The New Testament, and and if you look at how the New Testament is structured, the New Testament is structured, uh, it it is introduced by four four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in those uh, those books, we see um, it's really uh, biographies, of Jesus' life uh, contains a lot of theological truths. We see some doctrinal truths through it. But what we see is we see a picture of Jesus' life from four different perspectives. And so as we keep that in mind, we move from the four Gospels into the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a favorite book of many, many people because of the the practical aspects of it as we as we see in chapter 1 that um, the events that have led up after Jesus' resurrection from the grave and he's just about to ascend to heaven and he calls his disciples together and says, look, you will be my witnesses. And I'm paraphrasing. He says, you will be my witnesses in uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the world, to the far ends of the earth. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going, I'm going back to 
sit at the right hand of my Father, not because I'm tired, not because I need a break, but because my work has been complete here on earth. And I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father. There's one coming in my place, and that one happens to be the Holy Spirit. He will be here in my place. He will reveal to you and bring to memory the things that I have taught you through the time my earthly ministry here over the last three years or so. And He will be the one that uh, will guide you as, as have I through this time. And so we see that the disciples were so sold out to what Jesus taught them. Because just imagine for a moment walking with Jesus for three years, and especially if you were uh, Peter, James, and John, getting to be on the inner circle and seeing uh, Jesus perform some of the miracles and hearing the conversations that, that they had. When Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit was going to come to go and pray expectantly, they did. And so they prayed for 10 days. And man, when the Holy Spirit came, uh, he came onto the scene in an incredible way. 3,000 uh, souls were saved, and I'm sure many more um, as well that are not recorded. But listen, the, uh, the story is, as we go through the book of Acts, we begin to see practical aspects of, of living as a Christian. And we see the beginning and the birthplace of the church in um in this book but the main source in in the book of acts is is the holy spirit coming on to the scene and so um, acts is continuing the story of jesus now exalted but living and reigning through his spirit and revealed word in the ongoing advance of the church and that's kind of that acts 1 1 through 8 thing we see second thing that he points out is jesus is the source of that revelation and while he was presently uh, present bodily with his disciples uh, Jesus explicitly said that he would send his spirit which he did and then in the New Testament we have both the as we move on through the Old Testament throughout the Old Testament we see the spirit enabled recollection uh, uh, recollection of Jesus's words and deeds and then the ongoing instruction of the church through uh, specially designated eyewitnesses and we see that through some of Paul's writings and uh, Peter uh, and so and then the writer of Hebrews and so um, we should not just read when we're reading through the um, New Testament and we we see the Gospels the four Gospels and then we see this um, isolated book of Acts that kind of kicks off the birth of the church then we move into Romans and then uh, on through the, uh, the epistles, we see that uh, some people want to look at those sometimes and isolate them from the gospels and say, okay, here, you know, these are the, this is the, the, the big thing here, and then here's the stuff that Paul wrote, which people don't discredit Paul, but uh, and then this is something that Peter wrote and John uh, in, uh, in his three, three epistles. And, and so we want to be careful that we read it all connected. Jesus' life through the four books of the, of, the, of the four Gospels, the birth of the church as a result of Jesus' work and uh, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And then from there on, we see a picture of the Christian life and the challenges we may face and the things that we do. But it's all as a result of Jesus' work here during his earthly ministry, but namely his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. And so, thirdly, we then see Jesus as the supporting substructure of this revelation. And so, uh, should we understand, uh, how then should we understand the various ethical uh, exhortations in the New Testament as being Christ centered? Here, here's uh, some examples Jesus and his person and work provides the undergirding, the theological substructure for the expected response of God's people. Note how Paul begins the section of moral exhortation in his letter to the Ephesians. And so let's listen to how Paul handles this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. See, the Ephesians were called uh, or chosen by God's gracious saving intervention 
in Christ and they had been forgiven a debt they could never pay and now the inspired apostle is charging them to live transformed lives in conscious dependence of their Savior. And so basically what that is is then the uh, Christians in Ephesus are to live worthy of their calling that where they are where there is a departure from pure faith in the sufficiency of Christ's atoning death the inevitable results of of its safe of the community's strife and immoral behavior and so you can then go back uh, to Galatians and you can kind of see a picture of both doctrinal and moral problems that would uh, better make better make it understood how these things are interconnected and so uh, sometimes uh, as Dr. Plummer says here he says too many Christian authors and preachers fall into the error, error of moralism and basically what that is is um, uh, these things that you need to do this or you better not do that and it's all about the things that you do and um, I've said it for many years uh, to our students and I've said it in in church as well that our relationship with Jesus is um, not based on do's and don'ts now understand there is aspects of do's and don'ts but the fact is that when we come to him and we surrender our lives we're in the middle of the of doing all the don'ts that you could think of as we're living our life and following our heart which is deceitful and so when we surrender our life to Jesus and we we see the work of Jesus and we fully begin to understand who Jesus is and what he's done and what I mean just the weight of that if we begin to fall more in love with Jesus our life begins to transform because of because of Jesus and because we love him the things in our life will want to change it's not so much about this uh, legalistic list of things is like in order to be right with Jesus you better do this and this and this and this and you can't do this 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 and this and there are aspects of that I mean Paul wrote about that Paul Paul and Galatians wrote to uh, to kind of tell us the law that tells us of our shortcomings but then at the same time he told us about grace he told us about the good news the release and the relief from those uh, things that we were guilty of and so it's not all about living uh, with a strict moralistic viewpoint we need to also uh, live in grace and so many Christian authors and preachers fall into this era of moral, moralism where they fail to connect the ethical instructions in scripture with the finished work of Christ and his subsequent empowerment of his people I mean that's a great uh, great statement by Dr. Plummer there and so um, Sometimes uh, a defining element, of, excuse me, a defining element of our, our fallen condition is that we are simply prone to want to justify ourselves before God. Paul wrote about that in Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Dr. Plummer closes this section and this thought with this sentence. We like to keep score, being especially conscious of those whom we have surpassed in our facade of righteousness. And Paul spoke of that as well in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14. And isn't that a, uh, that's a convicting sentence right there if we are really honest with, with ourselves. And I can't pay, put any judgment on anybody else and I can't uh, point fingers at anyone, but I can sure look at myself in some of these things. And I pray that you will uh, allow yourself to look and take a real look we like to keep score being especially conscious of those whom we have surpassed in our facade of righteousness listen that doesn't mean that everybody's putting on a facade but i'm going to tell you right now sometimes when we come to church or we're around for folks we go to church with sometimes it's really easy to uh, want to make things a little better than maybe they are going and uh, maybe that's human nature but you know human nature is also sinful <laughs> And so we have to be careful there. Um, another thought that he has is Jesus as the solution and the sufficient Savior of the revelation. Uh, those who claim to have a relationship with God in Christ but do not demonstrate conviction of sin or righteous behavior, um, they're lying. <laughs> so it just, in, just to be perfectly honest. And at the time, the Bible... Uh, uh, 
constantly teaches that all persons, both Christians and non-Christians, regularly fail to keep God's commands. And so that's not what we're talking about. Okay, I mean we're going to we're going to mess up. We're going to to fall. We're going to fall short of God's glory and God's standard. We're going to miss the mark, which is you know what when we talk about sin, that's what it is in archery. If you you miss the the target or, or miss the bullseye, you know it's a sin and uh, that's this picture here and so that's not what it's talking about what it's talking about is to say that you're following Christ and you're, you're walking in the ways of him but really you're not that's not really not really the, who, you, who you are and what you, what you do and so when confronted with God's ultimate standard of holiness whether in the Old Testament the Old, or the New Testament we're always reminded of our uh, unworthiness and are pointed to the sufficiency of Christ. And see, our sin is a big problem. And uh, Jesus, as Dr. Plummer says, where he says, sin is the problem, Jesus is the solution. And so just taking those two sentences right there, we can go all the way back to uh, Genesis 3, all the way through the rest of the Bible, and we can see how uh, the cause... I mean, the, we can see the, the then and now statements, right? Sin, or, or since. Since sin is a problem, Jesus has to be the solution. Because sin is now the problem, there must be a solution, and that solution is Jesus. And so we can see that all the way through the Bible. And then if we think it that way and we see it that way, perhaps it will help us uh, grasp it a little better. In this sense, Martin Luther was right to speak of dividing all Scripture into these categories. And we talked about this um, last time, if I remember correctly. And he talked about breaking them into the category of law and, and gospel. Every passage in the Bible is, got, is a two-sided coin. Um, one side shows us the need, our need, which is the law. The other side shows us the provision of God in Christ, which is the gospel. And when confronted with sin, our sin nature, we cannot remove, which we cannot remove, we cry out with the Apostle Paul, what a wretched man or woman I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is our rescue. He's the one that's going to pull us out of this uh, wretched, sinful way that we are. It is only through Jesus that we can. In the book Pilgrim's Progress, uh, we see an illustration that where a uh, Christian and a non-Christian are kind of uh, having a dialogue here. Actually, two people. I should say Christian, not Christian. Two folks. It says, you already have been unfaithful in your service to him. How do you think you will receive wages from him? Where are uh, Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? You lost courage when you first set out and you fell into the swamp of despond. When you tried to get rid of your, your burdens in the wrong ways instead of waiting till your prince had taken it off. You simply slept and lost your scroll. You were almost persuaded to go back at sight of the lions. And when you talk about the, your journey and what you have heard and seen, inwardly you are seeking your own glory in all that you say and do. All that is true and much more that you have left out. But the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. And besides, these failings possessed me in your country and I have groaned under them, been sorry for them and have obtained pardon from my prince. That's a beautiful picture where we have sinned and where we have fallen short. But we know where our rescue and where our forgiveness comes from. Now let's look quickly at our Old Testament uh, reference. Uh, many Christians are aware that there are a few Messianic promises in the Old Testament and uh, that point to Jesus. Many times those very verses are the theme verses of the Christmas season where we uh, talk about for unto us the child is born and um, his name will be called Emmanuel. Uh, uh, the, in, in all these verses and but those are not the only verses that, that point and speak of Jesus. So let's look. 
Uh, the fifth point that he makes in this chapter, now we're talking Old Testament, is Jesus is the propositionally, propositionally promised Messiah. A number of these texts we see throughout the Old Testament, uh, that is, pr the promise and the coming of Jesus. And here we see in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up his infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But, we, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all as sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. And so most, uh, most Christians assume that any Messianic Old Testament uh, citation in the New Testament in, is in this category, but in reality, that's not necessarily the truth. Um, some New Testament Messianic uh, citations of the Old Testament are not propositional uh, predictions. Uh, they're really more what the second section is and that is topologically anticipated uh, verses talking about a, a anticipated savior and so many New Testament authors cite Old Testament texts applying to Jesus that originally had different that really had a different meaning and that's that would be true we talked uh, last week or week before last um, about the text that uh, that was written, uh, and my mind just went blank, and I apologize. That was uh, written for the uh, for that moment, and if you just with a little patience, right quick, I'll get right back to that. In Isaiah chapter seven, verse fourteen, it says, "Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign: the virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son." It will call him Emmanuel. And uh, that was written in the time when uh, King Ahaz of Judah uh, was reigning. And uh, Isaiah says that before the promised child is a few years old, Ahaz, uh, Ahaz's adversaries, the, the kings of uh, Aram and Israel, will be defeated by the Assyrians. Then 700 years later, Matthew uh, quotes this verse as fulfillment of the birth of Jesus. And so, not that necessarily uh, Matthew was wrong for that, and or, but it's, it still was a uh, way of pointing to Jesus, but it was not the original meaning in that day. But, man, Isaiah, would how thrilled um, he would be to know that, um, that that fulfillment came through the Messiah of those scriptures. And so while we must allow the biblical author's explicit uh, topological reflection to guide us, nearly any Old Testament text that we read can legitimately be viewed in this way. Uh, the Old Testament sacrifices remind us, uh, reminded the Israelites of sin, but Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice does away with sin. Um, if we were to go back and I kind of let me lay out something that Dr. Plummer did here, the climax of God's intervention intervention in the life, death, and resurrection of Messiah Jesus. For example, the Bible's, the biblical author's understanding of redemptive history works out this way. This is really interesting. God's deliverance of the Israelites out of Egypt in Exodus chapters 1 through 15 foreshadowed his bringing them back from Assyrian exile in Hosea chapter 11 verses 1 through 12. Moreover, if on the basis of of God's unwavering promises, he did not allow Israel, his chosen son, to perish in slavery or exile. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. How much more when the unique son Jesus faces the danger of death and exile, God the Father preserves him and brings him back into the promised land. Otherwise, how can the son fulfill his mission to the lost sheep of Israel? See, uh, seeing such divine intentionality of God's increasingly climatic historical interventions is called typological interpretation. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in a few weeks. And so it's very interesting uh, that as we read, we can see how Jesus ties in 
you know, to to everything if we just think about it and, and look of how when God allowed the Israelites to um, be rescued so many times, how he was sending Jesus to rescue us once and for all. But lastly, Jesus as seen as a solution and a savior. As noted above, uh, one should see all the demands of Scripture as ultimately impossible of being fulfilled by fallen human beings. Listen, there's no, there was no amount of sacrifices that we could do ourselves to even scratch the surface of the work that Jesus has done in our lives and done for us if we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Our constant failure in the light of God's holiness points us to our need for a Savior. Paul, he reflects on this so many times. Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he writes, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And then he writes uh, in Galatians 3, 23 and 24, Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. What a great way to close out today's session, that as we read and we see uh, the truths that are just, I, I hate to say hidden in God's Word, but many times there are hidden truths all throughout the Word. And, and it's my prayer that as we uh, seek the Holy Spirit, as we look at God's Word and prayerfully daily, that you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you maybe exactly what the Word, not maybe, but absolutely what the Word and what the Holy Spirit was inspiring the writer to write right at that moment, but also to see see forward because we're living in the, living forward how how it was pointing and leading to Jesus' arrival on the scene if you're reading in the Old Testament but in the New Testament how we're reading and seeing the work of Jesus and the things he was setting in place for us as he was leading up to the cross the, the victory over sin as he breathed his last breath the victory over death as he walked out of that grave and the eternal home we have in heaven as he goes before us to get that way and the place prepared for us and to sit at the right hand of God the Father and advocate on our behalf say that child is he is mine my blood has covered him and God is able to say then they are pardoned. They have been forgiven. They will be eternally in heaven with us. As we read the Bible, I pray that we see it pointing at Jesus in everything that we do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his work, for all the ways that he, he has revealed to us through the Old Testament and even through the New Testament. Pray that we would We would just hold on to the things that uh, we receive from your word. Father, may we always see, the, uh, see Jesus in everything that we read. Father, please show us. If there's someone listening tonight or tomorrow or any time that they're watching this, I pray if they don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that, um, that they would just call out to you, telling you that they are a sinner in need of a Savior, and that they know that there is no way for them to uh, receive eternal life in heaven except through the work of Jesus Christ. I pray they would call out to you. I pray they would reach out to us and tell us that they have placed their faith in Christ and that they want to know what the next steps are. Maybe they want to ask more questions, Father. Just pray that you would give them the boldness to reach out to us so that we can uh, visit with them, we can pray with them, we can celebrate with them, Father their new life found in Jesus. And I pray this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen.